uh, entitled the teaching, and we're, we're going to continue at least one more session um, <clears throat> from Sunday, entitled it Our Profession of Faith. And we've looked and worked out of a few passages of scripture from Hebrews where Jesus is revealed as the high priest of our profession. And you can turn with me in your Bibles there to Hebrews chapter 4 to begin with. One of our memory verses for the week, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is the high priest of our profession, as it said over there in Hebrews chapter 3. He is the high priest of our profession, not just as a Christian. Uh, we can think beyond that. That is, we understand that we claim Christianity. We say that Jesus is my Lord. I've placed my trust in his shed blood. Now that's a starting point, isn't it? But as we continue to walk in our relationship with the Lord, we come to know that there is a great deal that the Lord has provided for us. We are to be a people who stand on his word and declare what he has, had to, say, what he has to say regarding our, our lives. It may be with regard to a, uh, a need that we have, uh, a besetting sin, uh, the need for guidance. We are to be a people who declare, profess, confess what God has to say. He is the apostle and high priest of our profession or our confession. Sometimes when we think of confession, we talk of confessing sin. Well, that's only part of confession from a biblical standpoint, isn't it? We'll probably get to talking about confessing sin. But remember that in its literal form, this word that is translated in the King James as confession or profession means to uh, say the same thing as. It's the compound homologia. The same, we speak the same words that God speaks regarding the situation. Amen? Amen. We've, you know, we, we understand that we're to hold fast to a profession of faith. Well, the, the basis for any faith in God is his word. Amen? So when we speak of holding fast to a profession of faith, we're talking about holding fast to a profession of his word. We speak of there being great and precious promises, things that God has declared to be true regarding our circumstances, our needs, uh, battles with the enemy, uh, relationships, Jesus is soon coming. So many things that the Lord is, has spoken regarding our relationship with him, how we are to function and uh, function victoriously in this world, a sin-cursed world under the rulership of the devil. God has spoken to us of what he has provided, his word. It is his word, those, pr those truths, those promises, those right perspectives, attitudes that we are to profess, we are to declare. We looked at that passage over in Hebrews 11, didn't we, where the pilgrims they declared themselves the people that were passing through who did not receive the promises in this life they consider themselves to be pilgrims didn't they just passing through is that your perspective you're not going to be disappointed and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, call God into question as to why you didn't get yours in your time frame if you don't you look to the Lord, you stand on his word, you believe that what God has promised, he's able to perform, and you profess that. Amen? You believe that what God has said regarding your situation, your need, your life, is yours, and you stand on that. But you may or may not see it come to pass in this life. The Bible says that those whose lives are described, whose testimonies are described there in Hebrews 11, they died not having received the promises. 
but they were a people who declared that they were just passing through. Pilgrims in this earth. Is that your declaration? Do you consider yourself to be one just passing through? If you partake of some good at the hand of God, and we all do, and I, I shouldn't have put it that way even, we all partake of great good at the hand of God each and every day. But, you know, we can talk openly. We've known brothers and sisters who have stood on his word for uh, him to, for the Lord God to provide in a particular area. And they died without having received that benefit. Does that make God a failure? And faith only a farce. God's true to his word. And while there is biblical basis for standing to see his salvation in the land of the living, amen, you might not see it in the land of the living. You might die in faith. As one who declares that this earth is not your home, you're just passing through. God's true to his word. And what he has promised, he is able to perform. And you hold fast to that profession. And Jesus teaches us to hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering, for he's faithful who promised. Amen? Amen. Regardless of what the nature of the need might be, hold fast to a profession of faith. He is faithful who promised. We took some time in the afternoon service and we talked of Prayer is a profession of faith, and we'll pick it up there this evening with a couple more examples. You could look with me to Psalm 143. In our prayer to God, we are declaring, again, what we believe to be true according to his word. When you're praying, are you mindful of praying the word of God? praying according to the word of God, or I'm not saying you have to quote it directly from King James, uh, you know, some, some inspired and infallible translation, such as the King James. But you stand on the promises of God as you pray. An example that, that we could all relate to, maybe you've got some malady, a sickness in your body. We know to look to the word of God that deals specifically with the subject of healing, don't we? The Bible says that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, by his wounds, were healed. Amen? The Bible says that he has sent his word and healed us. The Bible says that he has forgiven all our iniquities and healed all our diseases. In prayer... With, before God with a physical need, do you pray the word of God? I hope you do. You stand on what is declared to be true regarding your situation. You pray the word. A profession of faith. A profession of faith in God's word, in his character, in his care and keeping power. Amen? You pray what the Bible has to say. Provision. You know, you're, you're facing any particular need. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You make that your declaration in prayer. God, I believe that you are the one who will provide all that I have need of according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you just pray the problem? Do you just say, God, we're broke. Is that what you pray? Pray what God's word has to say. Amen? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Amen? Lord, you can pray. You know, you can say, Lord, you have said that, that we are to be a people who give, and it shall be given unto us. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And for your glory and by your grace, I have practiced giving freely, liberally. I've been a cheerful giver, and now I, I have this need, and I'm trusting you to meet the need. You can do that, can't you? In faith? Pray what the Bible has to say regarding your situation. The word. When we speak of holding fast to a profession of faith, 
It's a profession of faith directly from his word. And I'm not saying that when you pray to God, you, you always got to be quoting scripture. No. But you should find strong basis for your prayer in what is plainly revealed in the word of God. Amen? Pray according to the word. Here he says in Psalm 143, verses 7 through 9, Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest they be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. From mine enemies, I flee unto thee to hide me. Well, in time of trouble, we run to the Lord and we can pray prayers like this, can't we? We can say, God, hear me. Hear my prayer because I'm placing my trust in you. Many are they that rise up against me and say of my soul, there's no help for, thee, for me in God. But you're a shield about me. You're as a high tower. You're my glory and the lifter up of my head, O Lord God. Hear me speedily. And he does. You're praying according to his word. And Jesus is the apostle and the high priest of that declaration, that profession. Here the psalmist is declaring his trust in his father, isn't he? In God Almighty. To keep him. To protect him. To keep him from evil and from the evil one. He's declaring his trust in God, isn't he? And so we should do so in our prayer. We make our prayer a profession of faith, trust, confidence, reliance upon our God. He's a good God, a loving heavenly father. Look at me over to John 11. John chapter 11. This is Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. We read from verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Now we visit this one because when we talk about a, a profession of faith in prayer, we should have this kind of confidence, shouldn't we? Lord, I know that when I pray, you hear me. Is that presumption? Is that mm, irreverent or arrogant? No, it's just confident and loving of any father. Is God your father? Does he love you? Are you welcome in his presence? Is he the one that says to you, you come boldly? Seeing we have this high priest at the right hand of God, come boldly, confidently under the throne of grace. You believe that? You're not only welcomed, you're instructed to come. You know, that, that's not just instruction, that's, that, that's not just encouragement, that's instruction, isn't it? Come boldly boldly under the throne of grace. And as we do so, we come sometimes with words, don't we? Sometimes just to, to, to bow in, in silent reverence before him, but sometimes it's to let a request be made known, isn't it? It sure is. And here, <clears throat> we see Jesus saying, I know you hear me. I know you've heard me. I know you always hear me. God hears when his people are coming to him in faith, declaring his word. That's a, that's a, coming with the word of God is a good way to come before the Lord. You will have a confidence that the Lord <clears throat> hears you. Amen? Go with me over to <clears throat> Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Our prayer, our petition, a profession of faith. From verse 30, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. 
The multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? Well, we've, we've uh, scratched our heads at that question from time to time, haven't we? I mean, they're crying out for mercy. They're blind. And Jesus calls them and says, what do you want me to do for you, boys? He wanted them to say, didn't he? He wanted them to, he wanted them to speak it up and, and let it come out of their mouth. He wanted to hear them profess their trust and confidence in him. They wouldn't be asking just anybody for healing from bl blindness, would they? But they came to Jesus because they believed that he was able and willing. And he was. And he did, didn't he? Amen. You know, there are, I know we said it over the weekend, but I want to say it again. There are a lot of Christians who are aware of needs in their lives and they don't bring them in a biblical manner to the Lord that, that, that the need might be met. Now these people, these two men were bold enough to cry out to Jesus. They were told to shut up, quiet down, don't bother the master, and they just cried out all the more. And even when they get an audience with the Lord, then the Lord asks them, okay, what do you want? He wanted them to say what they wanted. And you know, we could sit here this evening and we would say, well, God knows before I ask. We know those truths. But you know what else he says? He says he, he teaches us to ask. He says, ask and receive that your joy would be full. And that's what he wanted these people to do. And a profession of faith in, in Jesus Christ is a great and a wonderful and biblical way to declare where we stand in our relationship with the Lord. It's not sufficient for Christians to simply know that they have needs and that God is able to meet those needs. There's still a lot of ground between those two. God's able and we're over here needy. We, he knows he's able and we know he's able. What are we going to do to bridge that? We let our request be made known. We declare what God says. And Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our profession, says, that's one of ours, Father. The high priest is one who ministers on the behalf of the people. He's that, that mediator between God and man. Amen? Amen. Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and man, takes what God has provided, God Almighty has provided for us, and gives it to us, ministered to us, that we would have what he desires to have, us, desires us to have, what he has provided for us. But we need to tell him where we stand on this matter. I believe, O oh Lord, that according to your word, this is what you have provided for me. This is your will. I, to the best of my knowledge, this is your will. And sure, sometimes it might be, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's always part of any prayer, isn't it? The understanding that God knows beyond our knowledge. But we stand on his word and we declare what his word has to say to the best of what has been revealed by his spirit. Amen? Amen. The best of our knowledge, what has been, what has been revealed. <clears throat> what will you that I should do unto you? Can you hear God speaking that to your heart? Hmm? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Can you quiet yourself before the Lord and, and consider that question? What if God were saying that to you? Maybe consider, isn't he really saying that to you? Isn't he always saying that to us? Isn't it always his desire to provide his very best for us? Isn't he the one that puts it on our hearts, the, the, the real needs? Oh, we can sit here again tonight and think of all the things that we'd like to have. But if we're, if we're sincere in our desire for God's will to be done in our lives, just want more of Jesus. 
So we're not, you know, asking for wealth and fame. And, you know, no, no. There's probably something that God's dealing with us, each and every one of us, on regarding our walk with him. Holy, holiness. Uh, Christ-like character. You know, things that endure and that abide. Amen? You know, when seeking first the kingdom of God, we think in terms of seeking first the kingdom of God. The Bible says, what a, what, a, what a relief that's to bring to us, isn't it? You know, the, the things that we have need of will be what? Added to us as we're seeking first the kingdom. Amen? We don't need to uh, seek all those things that the Gentiles seek after, do we? No, we put Jesus first. Seek, seek God's will for our lives. His character. Saving grace. And what we have need of will be added. What will you that I should do unto you? How can I, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Can we hear the Lord saying that to us? And then what would we, what would we make our request? Well, right there. That's what we're talking about in this teaching. Right there. Make that your request. Make that your profession. Make that your declaration. Lord, I believe for the grace to be patient, kind, bold, disciplined. I mean, on and on we could go. And the Lord uh, knows that we fail in those areas sometimes and you hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 We also talked about, <clears throat> and I wanted to revisit these, these couple points, but we talked about uh, the profession of our faith as we preach the gospel. <clears throat> and we talked about the exclusivity of the gospel. And I just wanted to touch on this again to just reinforce it further in our hearts and in our minds. <clears throat> the preaching of the gospel is, is <clears throat> it's a, it, the gospel message is exclusive. All-inclusive, but it is a very narrow way, isn't it? God's, God says, whosoever will may come, but he says there's only one way to come. Only one way, and it is God's way. Just today I was talking with a, <clears throat> a gentleman who's a Roman Catholic, and I told him that <clears throat> uh, Marion and I were born-again Christians, and he, and he just got a smile on his face, and yet we're all, there's really just one God up there, and just many, many ways they come to him. And I smiled back and said, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> and just talked to them briefly about the way that is described in the Bible, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ, that a man must be born again or he cannot see the kingdom of God. And <clears throat> we're, yep, we understand that we're supposed to be very tolerant and very accepting of all kinds of different beliefs. But God is not that way, is he? So why should we uh, allow ourselves to be poisoned, leavened with the wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and devilish, and depart from the, the gospel message. Why should we do that? When we're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Savior, the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father but by him. Then that truth is, is strengthened in our hearts and, and minds. You're under a lot of pressure to tone it down and to be tolerant of all this different uh, belief. And <clears throat> we are not just talking about secular society on your workplace where they want you to take the classes in well, whatever they call those classes and just being accepting and tolerating of, of all these different lifestyles. Uh, no, nope, it's, it's in the church. The church is being leavened to accept and they are, uh, you know, there are, there are people that would profess Christianity that would say, well, you know, um, <clears throat> you can have 
homosexual interests and thoughts and desires, just so long as you don't practice them. You can have you know, homosexual uh, passions and desires just so long as they're never actually put into practice and you, you're, you're just fine. And that was, there's, a, there's, there's all kinds of, of, of talk. I mean, there was that, that uh, guy out in Ohio there that, you know, that, that got pulled from some of the Christian radio channels because you know, a, a well-known teacher, uh, Alistair Begg. Somebody ever heard of him? Yeah, he got pulled from, you know, from um, a lot of channels because um, of uh, uh, really a compromising stand with regards to how you relate to the, un the unsaved transgender who's going to get married, you know, who's your little niece or nephew or grandchild or something. And uh, just a, a worldly, weak, uh, compromising uh, response. And... Uh, it's, um, it creeps in, and I, you know, the, the brothers taught a lot of good. And I'm not real familiar with his ministry, but I've heard him on a few occasions, and he's had, you know, some good things to say, but this is pathetic. <clears throat> well, we preach the pure gospel message, and we don't apologize for it, do we? No, we don't. The, the profession of our faith is a, a pure gospel, and as we do so, surely it causes our, to, uh, causes our light to shine all the more brightly. And, and you're strengthened yourself in your, in your conviction that what you are confessing is the truth of God's word. It just, it's like a brilliant light that drives out the darkness. P a plain proclamation or profession of, of pure truth is a very powerful thing. It makes it, 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 it's, like it, it's like it crystallizes and solidifies it in our, in our own hearts and in our minds. This is what the Bible has to say. The Bible says that there is salvation in no other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only Jesus. And you've heard the, all the other, you know, things about other religions, sincere, they're, they're devout and they're kind and caring, but, but what? If they're not Christian, then they're not right. And if a soul has not placed their trust in Jesus Christ, his shed blood, then they will die and go to hell. They will die in their sins. The condemnation that the world is under is, the, is that they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen? Amen. That's, and that, that, it's that plain and simple. So when we talk about holding fast to a profession of faith, we're talking about a profession that, that yes, is found in our, our proclamation of the gospel when we're just out and about sharing Jesus with people. That's a profession of faith, isn't it? You plainly declare where you stand. I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation in no other. That's what we stand up and that's what we... We profess, amen? And we are, we're not there, oh yes, well this is what I believe and that's what you believe and certainly we don't say, and, and I, you know, it's okay if you believe what you believe. Well, they're entitled to their belief um, as, a, as a free moral agent, but we're not, we're not in any way indicating that we consider that their belief is equally valid before a holy God. And yes, we shine the light brightly, don't we? with a, a plain profession of faith. None, none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Turn me over to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 9. Let's talk about profession and practice. Profession and practice. Read from the Second Corinthians chapter nine. I'm going to read from the NIV, beginning at verse ten. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 
This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Well, you heard the phrase that I want to revisit, didn't you? Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession. We talk about holding fast to a profession or a confession of faith without wavering. Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Well, it's one thing to say that you're a Christian, that you say that you believe these things, and it's another thing altogether to act in a manner that is consistent with your profession. Here Paul commends these people because that's what they were doing, isn't it? They said they were committed to helping out the, the saints here, and they did so, didn't they? And if I, you know, I got Mike here and said, you know, Mike, you can count on me anytime. You got a need, call me. You know, I just want you to know I'm here for you. And the need arises and he calls and he, um, I'm backpedaling. Uh, you know, I'm a busy, pretty busy right now. You know, can I give you a few numbers of other people you might want to call? Him? <laughs> and so, you know, Mike understands and, um, and uh, uh, knows that, you know, from time to time, any of us can find ourselves uh, occupied, but, you know, the similar situation arises down the road and he, you know, and he says, I'm going to give him another chance. <laughs> Calls me again. And, um, and again, uh, oh, hey, brother, Mike, hey, my brother, I appreciate you, love you, but uh, uh, unavailable. Well, my brother might, um, you know, begin to have concerns about the genuineness of the, the commitment that I make when I say, hey, I'm here for you, whatever it takes, any hour of the day or night, you know, whatever you need. Here, Paul commends them for their obedience to their confession. Well, um, you know, practically, uh, we've got, uh, well, you know, how about the, uh, the confession that we make to Jesus' lordship in every area of our lives? Jesus is Lord. That just can roll off the tongue so easily, can't it? Are we obedient to our Lord? All the time? We call him Lord. That means master. That is absolute, the highest authority in our lives. I mean, are we true, to, uh, true in our submission to him? Our obedience should accompany our profession, our practice, and our profession should be <clears throat> perfectly united, shouldn't they? If we say it, according to the word of God, Jesus is Lord, I'm, I, I yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto holiness. I'm not my own. I am my brother's keeper. I declare that I lay down my life for my, I love my friends and I lay down my life for them. Do I? Does my practice, <clears throat> is it true to my profession? I say I love, but Am I one who draws near with the lips but has a heart that's far from? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I tell you to do? If we profess in a particular area, Jesus is Lord, I'm committed to the people of God, the house of God, committed to prayer, then our practice should follow. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yeah, we should do in, in, in keeping with what we say. We should be doers and not just self-deceived hearers only. He gives thanks for the obedience that accompanies the confession of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> Goes me over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. From verse 12, James writes, So speak ye 
and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So again, he, he's, he's going to speak to that, isn't he? He's going to talk about what you say and how you act. Uh, they are to be joined and, and <clears throat> uh, they should be pure and upright. Our, our profession and practice should be true to God's word, his standard. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For ye shall have judgment without mercy that is showed no mercy. For mercy rejoices against judgment. And then he goes on, doesn't he? He says, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. They're to line up, aren't they? Practice and profession should be joined, should be one, shouldn't they? A true faith, trust in Jesus Christ, should be accompanied by a practice, a lifestyle that's in keeping with his word. We can't, God's not mocked, is he? He's not, uh, he's not deceived by an empty profession. Oh yes, I love you, my brother, I'm here for you. Be warmed and filled. I mean, he, he uses a, a pretty pointed example, doesn't he? A brother that's destitute, naked and destitute of daily food, doesn't have a meal and um, we just, you know, give him the pat on the back. Oh, brother, I love you. I'm praying for you. Be warmed and filled. May the Lord bless you and meet all your needs. And I send him away, naked and hungry. Well, you know that we're not just talking about, you know, a, a, an act of charity like that in, in, the, in that sense. We're talking about anything that we, we find to be true according to the word of God regarding our, our conduct, God's requirement upon our lives for Christian service, the way we are to relate to one another, maybe we take it over into just, you know, the love that we have for the brethren. We, um, we are to be there for one another, lay down our lives for one another. We're to be charitable in that we are, we're kind. We, we, we value the lives of our brothers and sisters and we are, to prepare, we are prepared to be there for them. We are practicing being there for them. Amen? Well, do we practice that? Because we know from a doctrinal standpoint, you know, from what the Bible has to say, I'm to prefer others better than myself. Do I? Do I? If I don't, then I have an empty profession. But when... You know, we talk about Jesus being the apostle and high priest of our profession. When I, before God, purpose and declare, I lay down my life for my brother, for my sister, for, my, for this body that the Lord has placed me in, these people of God, I am there for them. Needs arise, just the, 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 the need for kindness, care, uh, just uh, uh, hospitality, of uh, uh, friendliness. We use the example from time to time of individuals. We're, we're a small congregation. Our hearts should be open and ready, involved in, in any and every other life. Amen? We're not so big that, well, you know, God doesn't expect me to be close with everybody that, you know, all Christians universally. I mean, come on. We, have my limita I have, we all have our limitations. Well, yeah, that may be true, but the group isn't so big that we can't be friendly, outgoing, uh, a little, and, and a, little bit, a little bit more widely than we are. Amen? That we would be <clears throat> true to our confession. I love this one. I, lo I love the people of God. Well, the people of God are individuals, aren't they? I love, which means I love this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. And I'm there for them. And I go up and talk to them, show myself friendly, Welcome them into my life. Communicate to them that I, I, I want them a part of my life. Want to be a part of their life. <coughs> James, 
plainly, squarely addresses the hypocrisy of an empty profession, where they say they love, but just <laughs> empty words. Empty words. So speak ye, and so do. <clears throat> Goes me to one more passage of scripture. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I had anticipated getting to uh, confession of sin. I'm not sure that we're going to revisit this subject uh, come, come Sunday, but we'll see. But for now, Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You probably read this before and thought, mm, this almost runs cross grain a little bit to, uh, you know, to a passage of, 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 uh, such as Ephesians 2. By grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, here he says what? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. With a heart man believes unto righteousness, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. It almost looks like we, you should consider that confession is an important part. Because uh, Romans chapter 10 is every bit as inspired as Ephesians chapter 2. Amen? Yeah. Amen. You say what you believe. You declare what you believe. You know, um, <clears throat> we won't go to that right now, but there are several places in the Gospels where it's recorded, John's Gospel in particular, he records that there were those among the religious leaders who believed but wouldn't profess them openly because they were afraid if they did so, they'd be put out of the synagogue. That's not the kind of belief that we want to have. Amen? It's one thing to know that Jesus is Lord. There are, you run into people, who are, you run into heathens every day that believe there's a God in heaven. And they would not fight you that Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross for the... They wouldn't fight you on that. But they don't believe unto righteousness, do they? They're not declaring, they're not professing Jesus as their Lord, are they? You say so. Amen? You say, you get it out of your head. Let, let, it, be, let it fill your heart and come out of your mouth. Let it come out of your mouth what you believe, where you stand. And it would pertain to, yep, the salvation of your soul. But more broadly, salvation is an all-encompassing work of God that touches spirit, soul, and body. So when we talk about confession being made unto heart, man believing unto righteousness, confession being made unto salvation, yeah, salvation touches your body, using that as an example. Again, you confess before God that you believe that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. With the heart, man believes under righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. <clears throat> Same verse, 10th verse from the NIV. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. From the Amplified. For with the heart a person believes adheres to, trusts in, and relies on Christ, and so is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he confesses, declares openly, and speaks out freely his faith, and confirms his salvation. And I believe the Amplified really speaks to what's taking place in this confession. It's not necessarily a confession that uh, results in salvation. It's a confession of the salvation that you know has taken place and that is yours. And it does work to confirm it in our hearts. It's good for you to hear you say what you believe. That's, that's good for you. 
because the apostle and the high priest of your profession also hears it and ministers grace accordingly. You're strengthened as you declare what you believe, whether it be your righteousness, which is dealt with here in Romans 10, or any number of other provisions of the Lord for you, his child. Say what God says. Let it be your declaration, your profession, your confession, and hold fast to it, faithfully declaring consistently, without wavering, without faltering, without quitting, hold fast to a profession of faith without wavering. God is faithful. God who promised is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Expect of yourself, require of yourself to speak the word, <clears throat> to speak the word of God more boldly, more consistently. Speak God's word over your family, over your finances, over, <clears throat> over your flesh. Speak the word of God. Declare it is written. As you stand in faith before your Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the living word and the privilege that you give to us of being able to take it upon our lips. We hide God's word in our hearts. We hide your word there and make it our meditation day and night. And we proclaim it. We shout these truths from the housetops, in the streets and lanes of the city, in our conversations with one another. We make a bold, plain, clear, biblical profession of what we hold to be true, of what we, what we believe to be your word, your will, regarding our lives our brothers and sisters' needs, our families. The role that you would have us play in reaching a lost and dying world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to speak your word, to stand, to hold fast, firm to a profession of faith we trust you for this grace Father God speak up and say what we believe in Jesus name Amen Amen well be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus God's grace and peace go with you all